Well, welcome back to the Armchair Trader podcast. And uh, this week uh, we have on the podcast Scott Kyle and Patrick Fisher, who are co-authors of the book The Compound Code, an expert guide to trading stocks and options. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to get a little bit of a download from them um, on the book and also on some of the strategies that they talk about in the book. Uh, Welcome to the podcast, Patrick and Scott. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Um, so, so just to start off with, um, I mean, let's talk about the book first. Really, uh, it seems to cover quite a lot of territory for uh, traders and investors. Um, what what is in the book, and and why did you decide that it, that that you needed to write something like that? Yeah, this is Scott. I'll start out. So, um, I've been investing for nearly forty years, Patrick, for um, just shy of that, and he and I have known each other worked together for nearly uh, 25 years. So throughout that time as individual investors, traders, as well as professional investment advisors helping other people, we've just learned a lot along the way, made a lot of mistakes, seen other people make mistakes, see other people, uh, you know, have successful outcomes. So it was our goal and desire to um, codify that and put um, the benefit of, of those decades of experience in one place. There are obviously many, many aspects to investing and trading that one can that one can write about. Um, so we just kind of chose the best of things that have worked for us, things that we've seen uh, have worked for our, our clients, and then mistakes as well that people make, so that um, hopefully the readers can avoid those mistakes. And it actually covers, as I said already, it covers quite a lot of territory. Um, in there, for example, you're talking a lot about compounding itself. I mean, that's one of the central themes of the book. Um, what is compounding and how does that work in, in practice? I know it's a big a big subject, but uh, it's something that a lot of people seem to miss even when they've been investing for a number of years. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll take that, Stuart. I think that the, the basic premise of compounding is that if you have time in the market and you assume some sort of positive return, let's just say 10% for easy math, if you have $100 in the first year and you have a 10% return, you're going to have 100 and Ten dollars the next year, and so you compound ten percent over that, and you're going to have one hundred and twenty-one dollars. And so, the the sort of the spirit of compounding is that if you're able to keep the principal in the market and let it grow with market returns, every year you're starting out with more money to start with those returns. And so, I think similar to other elements of life, whether it be fitness or otherwise, people underestimate what they can do in a longer period of time. You know, give it a decade, you might double the money just by virtue of letting it sit there and compound at an eight to ten percent return. And if I can add, so of course, most people think about compounding, and it's true that it takes patience and discipline and time to have the effect of compounding really work. So it doesn't look like much in the beginning, in, in periods one or year one, two, three, those incremental gains, the money that's that's earning money on, on the money that you've earned, um, that looks small. But over long periods of time, uh, that can really add up. And we tend to underestimate how long our time horizon is for investing. Someone in their 50s may think, well, I only have 10 years because I'm retiring when I'm 65. But in reality, they'll continue to invest that money for sometimes decades thereafter. So so the the idea of being patient and letting the money letting your money work for you is very important. But also in the near term, compounding can work as well. Let's say you own a dividend paying stock that earns 4%, which would be typical, and you have $100 of that stock. Every quarter or 90 days, it will pay one dollar, because one dollar is is one quarter of four percent, and then now you reinvest that dollar and buy more shares. So then your next dividend, rather than being a dollar, will be more than a dollar, etc. So compounding can actually take into can can start building, especially with reinvestment of dividends in a shorter time period. And does this have any cyclical characteristics as well? Because uh, obviously the market goes in cycles. There are going to be those stocks that are consistent dividend pairs and, and and there's a lot of investors around the world who who know what those names are but for example during the pandemic uh, we saw a lot of stocks here in the UK suddenly stop paying dividends others continued what's your what's your feeling on that I mean is it something that people need to be alive to when it comes to dividend paying stocks particularly if you look at the best in class in any industry whether it's the coca-colas or the Pfizer's or the Microsoft's Generally speaking, they pride themselves on their ability to pay the dividend on a regular basis and also increase the dividend. And so, you know, barring sort of really, really long tail events like a pandemic, you're generally going to find that those companies continue to pay dividends. And we, what we find to be interesting is that from a security selection perspective, you can almost use the fact that they continue to pay consistent dividends as a way to help 
determine if that's a good stock to invest in because by definition, that means that they have good leadership, they have good corporate governance, they have a really good financial system to allow them to continue to generate the cash flow and pay it to investors. Yeah, and this also points to the idea of being well diversified. Of course, during any given period, whether it's a pandemic or not, even in 2022, we're well past the pandemic, but um, growth stocks, uh, the technology stocks um, really underperformed and value dividend stocks did very well. That's been somewhat the reverse this year thus far. So it's very difficult to time exactly what types of companies, be it growth, value, domestic, international, are going to do well during any short period. So being well diversified helps you to um, get the benefit of whatever's in favor at any point in time. And then further, in terms of the payment of dividend, even the, some of the best companies in the world, like Boeing, which is part of a, a duopoly, it cut its dividend, had nothing to do with pandemic per se. It cut it even before the dividend because of specific reasons. But um, if you have a well-diversified portfolio of you know, 30, 40, 50 securities, um, the reality is that if you pick the best of breed, the ones that have the, those consistent dividend payments as well as increases, like Patrick said, the vast majority of your companies will continue to pay that dividend. And then the, the one or two that may cut every th- few years, you can either replace those if you need the income, or often they bring the dividend back. And what's your feeling about um, fixed income securities like bonds? I mean, do they have a role to play in the private client portfolio? And do they would they fit into a strategy like this? Certainly, yeah. So I, I think when we look at working with new clients or even with existing clients, I think the first thing that we always try to do is do some sort of a financial plan. And that's a way to get a sense of what their time horizon is for the capital that they have invested. So, you know, to, to kind of cut to the chase, people want to make sure that they have enough money to retire and to live into retirement and that their money isn't going to, is going to outlive them. And once you have a good sense of their time horizon and their capital that they're investing in, you can then determine your asset allocation, which is exposure to equities and exposure to fixed income. Generally speaking, if someone's time horizon is longer than 10 years, mathematically speaking, you're better off being invested in equities because over a 10 year period, nothing's going to perform better than equities. That being said, if someone has some sort of need for cash, whether it could be, hey, I'm going to buy a home in a year or my son's going to college or I want to buy this car. If there's things that are known that are coming up, that's a great place to put into fixed income, particularly now. When fixed income, at least in the states, is paying you know almost five and a half percent for a short-term U.S. Treasury, so it's a very low-risk security with a guaranteed return for a very specific duration based on what that capital is needed for. And if I could just add, and that was well put. So, rule number one in investing is match your assets with your time horizon. If you need to pay lunch this afternoon, you should have it in cash no matter if the stock market's going up or down or sideways. If you don't need the money for, there's no magic number, but call it five years or more, then having that money allocated to equities uh, is, is typically prudent because of the return potential associated with stocks. Um, and then there's the in-between time horizon. But what the mistake that people make is they will either put long-term money into stocks and then once if and when stocks go down, they'll pull it, even though they still don't need the money for the long-term. That's a big mistake, thinking that you know that they can time the market or 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 they just get scared out of stocks, or conversely, if the market stock market is doing well, but they need the money in the near term, they don't have the discipline to put that money into fixed income, and fixed income would be the appropriate asset for their time horizon, let's say six months, a year, even a couple of years. So matching your assets with your time horizon is absolutely key, and given now that interest rates are higher, having some of your short-term money in fixed income is absolutely prudent. And by the way, um, depending on the bond or the, or the bond ETF, you can reinvest those interest payments as well. So if you own, let's say, you know, a, 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 an ETF that invests in two-year bonds, then every month, typically those ETFs pay an interest payment. And if interest rates go up and the bond price goes down, you're still getting the benefit of reinvesting and compounding. And you mentioned ETFs there as, as a means to getting exposure to the bond market. I know the, the ETF market in the US is very sophisticated and there's a lot of investors are actually you know fairly active in ETFs and it plays a big part in people's portfolios. Less so in Europe. I mean, it's starting to gather some steam here. But a lot of people, a lot of investors, um, particularly sort of older investors, are completely unfamiliar with the opportunities that ETFs offer. Um, what's your what's your view on ETFs? Do you do you make active use of them? When when you look at an ETF, and I'll speak about the, the ETFs that are offered in the states. I mean, it, it's really it's really the wrapping paper around the same present, which is some underlying securities. So whether it's in the structure of a mutual fund or a closed end fund or an open end fund or an ETF, 
that's going to be invested in some basket of securities underlying it. And so the structure or the wrapping paper of an ETF is generally a very low cost way to give investors access to some things, whether that's, you know, some sort of like new ETF that's just come up that's very sort of like cyclical and timely, or that's something like SCHD, which is Schwab's dividend paying ETF. It's a great way for investors to get exposure to oftentimes a broad basket of securities that they might not otherwise be able to have access to. But I think like anything, you have to know what it's actually invested in. You have to know what its tracking error is to whatever index it might be trying to track. And you also have to know what the expense ratio is because it could be really cheap, like two or three basis points, in which case that's a great way to get diversified exposure if you like what it's invested in. But at other times it could be quite expensive and sometimes investors don't see what the expense ratio is or understand that expense ratio means fees. Exactly. And, and, and ETFs have been marketed historically on um, on their low fees. But if you look at the universe of, of ETFs available now, there is actually quite a wide range of um, disparity in the fees. And they can, like some of them are quite expensive now. Typically, if someone's starting out and they have, let's say, a small capital base, an ETF can be a great way to begin their investment journey because at a very low cost, assuming you pick the right one, um, and with small dollar amounts, you can get broad diversification. So you can buy even the, the biggest ETF, I think, in existence, which is SPY, which is the S&P 500. You, know, you can get that for just a couple of basis points, and it gives you exposure to most of the U.S. stock market. So that's just a good way to start building your uh, start building your portfolio. And then once you get to a certain amount, you know, whatever that amount is, $500,000, a million dollars, what have you, then you could start diversifying away from that to maybe some individual stocks if you have time, uh, if you follow you know, a particular company, let's say. But uh, yeah, for many people, ETFs are just a great way to get broad, broad exposure and not take any single stock risk if they just don't have the time or wherewithal to do individual stock analysis. And I would just add one more thing on ETFs because I think it's, it, at least here in the States, it's, it's really a market that's exploded in the last you know, even three to five years is that not all ETFs are created equally in terms of who they're managed by, how they're managed, the fees, of course, distribution. But, you know, it seems like here every week there's a new ETF, like it's the AI ETF or it's the cryptocurrency ETF. And so just because it's an ETF doesn't necessarily mean it's a, it's a great investment. You still have to understand what the ETF is invested in. During the pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of uh, new investors enter the market. Uh, many of them were chasing the likes of GameStop and other meme stocks. Um, there is still a mentality uh, amongst particularly younger investors that the stock market can be a way to get rich very quickly. And there's a lot of talk on on the forums about 10 baggers, companies where you can make a lot of money very fast indeed. Is that a sound approach for for? Um, younger investors, particularly guys in their twenties, I'm thinking of here, who who have more disposable income because they may not have a mortgage, they don't have any kids, but they've got the cash to play with, and they they think they can actually get to a million dollars in a couple of years, not in twenty years of, of patient investing. I'll let Scott go first on this one. <laughs> yeah, I'll address this. I'm probably the oldest one on this call, so um, I I made my first stock investment in 1984. Um, and since that time, I've seen, you know, every fad, uh, short term trend, et cetera, come and go. So whether it was the Internet, uh, you know, 1987 uh, with the, the, the big crash, the Internet boom and bust, uh, uh, SPACs, they're calling them here, these special purpose uh, alternative companies, um, meme stocks, et cetera. And so typically those things end badly. They often, there's never a bell that rings when, when it's time to, to leave the party. So what I would say to that is, um, and, but it's very tempting because it seems like this time is always different, you know, whether it was the internet stocks, uh, I'm not talking that high quality companies like an Amazon, but you know, pets.com and there are many that came and went. Um, and, and so it's always very tempting because everyone's making money and you want to get in on it. And therefore, you know, why not me too? So the way I would approach that is to say, kind of looping back to the ETF, Start with just a well-diversified portfolio, um, and then on the margin, if you want to you know, allocate, let's say, 10% of your portfolio or, uh, or your capital to you know, trying to day trade or to trade you know, the latest trend stock, um, that's fine. But, but don't, you know, don't leverage. Don't make mistakes like a lot of people do. They will actually leverage or put more capital into a small number of stocks than they actually have. And then, or use options or derivatives, which are 
can often themselves be a form of leverage. And then, as we've seen, even with meme stocks, I think AMC, which was a meme stock here in the U.S., just hit a new all-time low in the last week or so, right? But it was the stock of the day, or of a few days anyway, uh, a year or two ago. Um, so yeah, just be very careful. Make sure you're uh, fr focusing first and foremost on downside protection. Uh, have your risk control parameters in place, being things like how big the position is. Don't use leverage, and just make sure that it's um, a small part of your portfolio and that you have time to track it. And recognize that at some point, the, the music is probably going to stop. And you don't need to be the last one to leave before the party ends, because usually, you know, at that point, it's too late. Um, so, you know, if you have some good profits, maybe take them and don't don't be greedy, because those profits can turn into losses very quickly. I, I totally agree. And I think I would, I would just add one more thing, having spent time in asset management and also spent time on a trading desk, because I think it's important to distinguish your time horizon with what you're really doing. You know, if your time horizon is three, five, seven years and you're planning for retirement and you're planning to buy a home, that's investing. If you're looking to day trade GameStop on your on your phone, on an app, when you're on the tube on the way to Canary Wharf, that's definitely trading. And there, there are different games or different strategies. There's different things that move the two. Um, and so I think if you're playing the long game, you're investing and you're looking at you know time horizons and asset allocation. If you're looking to make a little bit of money, Quickly, that's certainly trading. And I think to Scott's point, you just have to be clear about the fact that that's going to be a small part of your portfolio. Otherwise, you can end up getting stung pretty fast. And I think the other part, too, particularly for younger traders or investors that, you know, I know a handful of them here is that if you're in, you know, 10 years out of school, you've seen an economy that's had basically zero interest rates and equity markets that have ripped for 10 years. And so you haven't you haven't seen the pain of what economics can do to capital markets when interest rates go up. And so things aren't the same now as they were for the last 10 years. And they're, they're kind of mean reverting to, I think, where, where things should be. No, you're right. We've been in, I mean, we've been in that fantastic, there's almost zero interest rate party for, well, <laughs> over for a long enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you about shorting. I mean, in, in here in the UK, um, a lot of people sh trade on the short side using spread bets um, internationally using CFDs. Um, it is something that, you know, I've done myself and I've actually done quite well. I don't know whether I just have a negative mindset and I'm a bit more bearish sometimes, but I, f I feel it's easier to predict a share going down than one going up. But uh, is that is that um, a legitimate tactic in a portfolio? Um, uh, when should people be using uh, short trading and and who should be using short trading? In general, stocks go up over time. So by by definition, um, and I'm talking by stocks, I mean just you know a broad base of stocks, SP 500, the FTSE, whatever it may be. Um, they go up over time. There are always periods where they're down, but over long periods of time, they go up. You know, on average, seven or eight percent per year. So you have the the winds working against you to begin with. Uh, and so I, I certainly wouldn't short the overall market unless there's a very specific reason to do so over a short period of time. Uh, it, it may be offsetting some longs or something like that. So in terms of individual securities, um, you know, the, the most you can make is down to zero. There are plenty of people who are successful short. So I'm not suggesting don't do it at all, but just understand that your gains are limited to, to zero, you know, from the, the, the price that you're shorting it down to zero, whereas your losses are effectively unlimited because the stock can go from 20. It could be a meme stock. It could be a lot of people shorted and lost literally billions of dollars on the stocks we were talking about a moment ago, GameStop, AMC, et cetera, even though they would have ultimately been right because of margin and leverage and so forth, they never saw the day to get their gains because the stock went from you know 25 to 300 in a matter of a few weeks, and they got you know shaken out of their position as it were. Um, and so it's something where you you need to be very careful because of the risks associated with it, and you need to really be. It, it's more akin to trading or or speculating than investing. So if you have a long-term time horizon uh, and it's a retirement account, I don't think there's any reason to be shorting in that account. However, um, shorts can be a way to hedge your longs. So for example, you could have a 500,000 pound portfolio and have 300,000 of long and 250,000 of short such that the portfolio is fairly balanced. It's slightly long exposure, or you could be you know half long, half short. So you're agnostic to how the market moves. You just want your longs to go up 
um, and you want your shorts to go down, or at least your longs go up more than your shorts go up, um, if it's a bull market or vice versa. So there is a place, but you know you really need to do your homework. You need to make sure the position size is um, is appropriate, and you also need to know when to cut your losses because um, a, a single stock that goes the wrong way quickly can really um, uh, you know can do a lot of damage. Yeah, I, I agree with all that, and I think. The only two things I'd add is that generally speaking, if you're going short something, whether it's a stock or it's a currency or otherwise, it's usually an event-based reason why you're doing it. You could say the stock isn't going to perform in earnings, the stock's management has issues, the stock's product is doing something wrong, and there's like a specific reason and a time horizon you'd have that bet on. Or it could be something as, as simple as like, I think that Europe is going to be cold in the winter and the relationship with Russia to get oil. Like there's reasons you could be short anything, but it's specific time-bound kind of stuff. And that's generally a much shorter time horizon than you'd have investing in equity markets for a five, 10 year time horizon. And the other thing I just add is, 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 if, is if there is a good reason to be short a specific stock, you don't have to be short the stock. You could also buy a put, use a little bit of premium. We're talking like you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 cents per, per 100 shares and, and get exposure to the downside and still you know, have gains if the stock were to go down without risking capital of the broader portfolio to do so. And what's your view on some of these? Um, we've been discussing them internally not too long ago. These uh, funds who publish these highly publicized attacks on specific companies, um, they, they put some research out and it's like a um, sort of an attack on that company. Um, and they are obviously very transparent about it. They have a short position on the company. Frequently, they're very right. And it's obvious that some investors use that almost as an opportunity to make some money on the short side as well. Yeah, there are some very successful, very sophisticated um, sh- you know, short traders who do amazing research. And as you said, Stuart, they often uncover what is ultimately a, you know, I won't say a scam necessarily, but, but a, a situation that, you know, deserves the recognition that they're providing and the transparency they're providing. It might be some accounting irregularities or, or whatever it may be. And it's obviously case by case. So, of course, on the other side, the companies don't like that because um, it tends to push the stock down, especially in the near term. At the end of the day, fundamentals matter. And so um, you, know, you can't just talk a, a, a stock up or down indefinitely. You can in the near term. Right, because obviously there are there are plenty of analysts who put out good research on the long side, and often the stock will pop. Right, you know, Morgan Stanley just did a new research piece on Microsoft. The stock's up two percent, and that's fine. But then the day over long periods of time, as an investor, it's the fundamentals that matter. But news can certainly move a stock in the short term. So in the case of these research um, pieces that you talk about, typically, especially if it's a it's a well regarded you know firm that that does research on shorts and shorts stock itself, the stock will go down in the near term. But ultimately, you know, it's the fundamentals that will matter as to whether the stock continues to go down or ultimately, you know, rallies back up. Yeah. And I, I would just add that the, the concept of like activist investing and, and sort of taking over a company and, and shorting it, even, you know, taking enough of a position to change management and restructure the organization. Like that stuff's been happening for a long time, whether it's in the hedge fund space or the institutional space. And so bringing it to the broader market, whether it's by an ETF or some other structure, is just a way to get more people to put little bits of money into that strategy. I don't think it makes it any more and any less risky because you're still you know, doing something that's very activist based. But it's, it's not it's not new to Wall Street. I think it's just new to the to the average investor who might now have access to it with an ETF. And if I just add one thing to shorting, one one reason not to short typically is valuation. Oh, you think that would be the first reason to short? Hey, Amazon's trading at sixty times earnings. Um, uh, I'm going to short it and uh, go long Walmart as my pair trade because it's trading at ten times earnings. So, as Pat said, usually it's some kind of an event that's coming up or some specific research. Uh, you know, it might be more of a again like an accounting situation. But stocks can you know, e- even very high quality companies can stay quote overvalued for a long period of time. I mean, Amazon's been trading, you know, at, at what we consider a, a, an excessive valuation, 40, 50, 60 times earnings, sometimes no earnings at all, basically since its founding. And it's been one of the best stocks. Like at any point in time, you could dive in and say, Amazon is a good short because it's overvalued. But um, valuation, as much as that seems to be the, the best reason to short, is often the worst reason to short because companies can simply stay, stay overvalued for very long periods of time. 
Yeah, it's amazing how, how that can happen. Talking about options, uh, Patrick just mentioned options in passing there as as a means of uh, shorting stocks. I know in your book you've also you've also um, gone into some some depth on the uh, covered call options as well as a, as a source of income. Could you uh, explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so um, a covered call is set up by first buying a stock long. So we'll just use Pfizer. You can use you know, any company. Um, and then you sell a call against that stock. So let's say you buy 1,000 shares of Pfizer. And then each contract for the call contract represents 100 shares. So you'd sell 10 contracts for that position to be covered. If you sold more than 10 contracts, then you'd have some naked short calls. If you sold less than con- 10 contracts, then you'd be only partially covered. So let's say you sold five contracts, each contract representing 100 shares. Now you have 500 of your 1,000 shares covered and 500 unhedged. And so the, some of the benefits and some of the downsides of selling calls are, A, you get premium credit to your account, uh, so cash credit to your account that you can go and put in fixed income and have that cash earn earn income. Um, and so, and also it reduces the volatility of the portfolio. If you had Pfizer in one account with covered calls and Pfizer in another account without covered calls, if on a day Pfizer is down, just, you know, let's say the market's down, then the account for which there are covered calls, that account will have lost less that day than the account for which there are not covered calls. So by mathematical definition, you're, you're reducing the volatility of your portfolio. And it also provides a, a bit of a hedge in the amount of the premium. So the benefits are reduced volatility, income generation, and a bit of downside protection. So what are the downsides of selling a call? Well, you're capping how much you can make on that stock. So if you buy Pfizer for $34 a share, and you sell the 37 calls, and you earn a dollar of premium, now the highest uh, amount you can make on the on the stock is 38, which is the strike price, 37, plus the premium, 38. So basically what you're doing is you're giving up some upside in exchange for income, downside protection, downside protection and volatility reduction. The, the time to use it really is, if you have a very long time horizon and you don't need the income, right? Say it's a retirement account, you're not pulling money out, then there's really no reason to use options or, or, or less reasons to use options. And we can talk about when you still would. But if you have a, a need for income and you like to have, you know, sleep better at night and have a shorter, uh, have less volatility in your portfolio, then buying dividend paying stocks or even non-dividend paying stocks and selling calls can be a great way to generate lots of income. So between three potential profit sources, options, premium sales, dividends, and price appreciation, the most secure of the three is the premium sale because you get the cash credited to your account. The second most secure is dividends, especially if you buy you know, high quality dividend paying stocks, you're very likely to earn that income you know, every quarter, every 90 days. The least secure of the three forms of profit, at least in the near term, is price. Over long periods of time, price is likely to go up. But if you really want to, to see consistent returns, then the two of the three sources, options, premium sales, and dividends, are your best bets for that consistent return, especially in the form of income. And then again, price tends to follow over time. But in down markets, if we're buying dividend-paying stocks with covered calls, we have two of the three profit sources working at, at any point in time, right? And so um, it's just a way to kind of diversify your your income stream and your profit sources as well. <laughs> why why don't more people make use of it? Because it, it seems to me that only a you know, small number of private investors do this. I know I know a lot of fund managers who do it, but they're managing you know millions and millions i can i can see the sense there yeah i'll, I'll give a couple of, of ideas and then scott can kind of, kind of chime in and add you know i think the first just practically speaking from a diversification perspective you need to have 100 shares of each security in order to sell call options on it and you also don't want to have a portfolio that's got one position of 100 shares there's just no diversification even if it's the best stock on the planet you want to have more than one position in your portfolio so if you have 30 or 40 names in a portfolio and you've got 100 shares of each, you need to have a decent amount of capital to start trading options even to begin with. And then the other bit is that when you go from equity investing, particularly if you're investing in ETFs like the SPY or something, to picking individual names to then 
trading call options on those individual names, you're really getting into the realm of professional asset management. And it just takes a lot of experience and expertise and a lot of monitoring. I mean, there's many days where we look at portfolios and we don't do anything because things are kind of humming along. But it's not the kind of thing where you watch CNBC for 10 minutes, get an idea from someone and then put it on and kind of see how it goes on your Robinhood app. I mean, it's, it's, it's a much different level of oversight and sophistication. Yeah, if I think about it, the only people I know do, who, who are doing it consistently on their own portfolios are actually guys who who are also either fund managers themselves or used to be fund managers, and they're and they're they're using these kind of covered call options um, to generate income. Is it is there an issue with like the size of the companies you should be you should be um, holding for this kind of strategy and and or particular sectors? First and foremost, you want to make sure you're doing your fundamental research on the underlying companies because you can sell calls all day long, but if you buy a bad company, you'll never sell enough premium to offset the decline in a price. And I don't mean a short-term decline because the stock market is down 10%. I mean, you know, just a basically a bad investment um, where you know you're going to have permanent capital losses. So you should think about selling call options as an overlay to an otherwise high-quality portfolio. So whatever your goals are, if you're more long-term growth oriented, then buy you know the best of breed companies that are that fit those criteria. Be well diversified. If you're more income oriented, you know focus more on dividend paying stocks. So so you really need to think about your goals, your time horizon, and having a well diversified portfolio first and foremost. Full stop. Then if you have the time, the wherewithal, and the expertise, then you can layer calls on top of that. So I wouldn't pick a stock based on the option, I would sell an option based on the stock you chose. So whether it's, you know, and most stocks and even ETFs have options on them. So it's, uh, you you can use them for most securities, but you don't want to have the tail wag the dog. You want to just create a really well diversified portfolio and then say, okay, do I want to sell calls on some of these for certain purposes? I will just add the the final point where even if you have a long-term time horizon, one time to potentially sell a call is, let's say you bought a stock at 20 and it happened to do very well in a short period of time. Now it's at 30, you know, so it's up 50% in a few months for whatever reason, takeover, good earnings, whatever the reasons are. You still want to own the stock, but you'd like to do a little bit of a hedge. You may want to sell calls on strength just to provide a little downside protection to kind of protect those gains. Um, that's very different, though, than buying a stock and selling a call immediately. So it would just be looking at your portfolio saying, OK, I normally don't sell covered calls. This particular stock's up a lot. I'd like to use the benefit of that strength to sell calls and generate some premium. If it goes from 30 to 35, happy to have sold it. You know, you're basically like booking a sale ahead of time, so you have a reservation for a sale. In most cases, stocks don't continue to run up as quickly, so you'll just generate some incremental income, some incremental profit if the stock doesn't go up even further from that big gain it had in the short term. And just one more thing I'd add to the sort of the size of the company, which is, I think, part of your question, Stuart, is generally speaking, if you're looking at high quality dividend paying stocks, there's going to be a ton of volume and interest on both sides of every options contract that you want to trade. That being said, if you're looking to trade options on perhaps, you know, a newer issued stock or perhaps a smaller stock, just be mindful of how much interest or liquidity there is on both sides, because there could be a wider bid offer spread. I mean, oftentimes something like a Pfizer or Microsoft has a five cent bid offer spread, but something else that might be newer or smaller might have a little bit of a wider spread. And generally speaking, an individual investor is going to be, you know, a couple of contracts, maybe 10 contracts, which is a rounding error in relation to what institutional traders are putting on. So there's usually plenty of liquidity, but it's just something to be aware of if you're trading on smaller positions. So you're, you're saying like, you know, typical private investor usually no more than, you know, 10 of these contracts live at any one time. It, re- it, it, it really depends. But even if it's, even if it's 50 or a hundred, it's still a very small number relative to what is traded out there in the open market. And, and, and again, like if you're talking about any of the sort of name brand companies, it's a non-issue. But if you're looking at something that's like, hey, I want to put a call option on this new IPO because I just heard about it and it sounds cool. That's a, that's a good way to get upside exposure if you buy the call option. Or as we talked about before, if you want to short something, you could buy a put. Like there's other things that you can do and perhaps sort of like not high quality dividend paying stocks that you just want to be aware of the other side of that trade if you're going to put it on. And uh, I know we're, we're coming to the end of the podcast shortly, but um, the other thing I wanted to ask you guys about was risk management. Um, it's not so, it's something 
when I talk to fund managers, they, they talk a lot about it because they obviously get asked a lot about it by, by institutional investors. Uh, it's not something private investors think as much about. In terms of actual risk management on a portfolio, what what are your favoured tactics to to help to minimise downside impact? The definition of risk that you hear mostly spoken about you know, on, on financial channels is that of short-term volatility. People say the market's risky because it's moving up and down a lot. But in reality, if you allocate appropriately the assets to the time horizon, in other words, fixed income for the near term, you know, one, two, three years, and stocks for the long term, three years or more, then by definition, short-term volatility is not relevant to you because you're not looking to sell the stock in the near term. So really, the ultimate definition of, definition of risk is not short-term volatility, it's knowing what you're doing. Um, if, if I you know, was put in the middle of, I, I attempted the English Channel, if you put me in the middle of the English Channel, there wouldn't be a lot of risks, so I could probably swim to the other side. Put most people in, in the middle of the English Channel, and they'd be taking on a lot of risk, right? Because they don't have the skills and the wherewithal. So really, you know, know what you know and know what you don't know. That's just a starting point for risk. Then other forms of risk that we've talked about uh, on this show are lack of diversification. So if you're too concentrated, it could even be a great company, but you know there are many companies that have fallen by the wayside because of you know whatever the reasons are. So make sure you're well diversified. That will reduce your uh, overall risk. Make sure you all- allocate the right assets to the right time horizon. If you need the money in the near term and it's in fixed income, then it doesn't matter. Stocks could crash tomorrow. It could be the 1987 crash because it wouldn't affect you because you have money and fixed income that you need for the near term. And then finally, you know, the risk of the quality of the position itself and the size of the position. Uh, uh, make sure that you don't have any single position larger than call it maybe around 5%. Um, and then make sure you're, you're focused on the highest quality companies. And to the extent that you're doing kind of meme stock trading or trend trading, keep that as a small percentage of your portfolio. If you avoid those basic mistakes, lack of diversification, lack of quality, lack of uh, um, allocating the right asset to the right time horizon. If you avoid those mistakes, then um, the probability of success is very high. I, I totally agree with Scott, and I think having having spent time on the institutional side, you know, in a fund management seat, speaking to clients who are looking at things like value at risk and Monte Carlo simulations and notional exposure, those those types of things don't really apply to the in, individual or family investor when they're looking at retirement because by definition, the portfolio is going to be structured totally differently and their time horizon is totally different. So not to say that value at risk isn't an important thing to look at, but if you have a a portfolio of call it 70, 80% equities with some covered calls and the rest in in fixed income securities, your value at risk is is a non-conversation because A, it's not going to be very high and B, your time horizon far exceeds the one to three month time horizon that a fund manager kind of has to work on. The the ultimate form of risk, really, and people don't like to think this, but but we as individual investors, we are the ultimate form of risk. It's really internal. People always want to think of risk as being outside. But even if you do everything right and you don't have the emotional fortitude to hold on to stocks when they're down, it's not a matter of if they'll be down in a short period of time, 10, 20 percent, if it's a bear market. It's a matter of when. So if you haven't done a financial plan, don't have appropriate asset allocation, and you don't have the right emotional makeup, and then you sell stocks when they're down, thinking that you'll know, buy them back once the sun comes out, which usually means they're back up 20%, 30%, then, then you've taken on that risk. It has nothing to do with the market. Has, it doesn't have anything to do with your holdings. Really, you know, oneself is, is usually the ultimate form of risk. And so just know what you know, know your emotional makeup. And, and if you don't feel like you can get through those inevitable difficult times, then have someone assist you because they're going to be objective and they'll, they'll be able to talk you off the ledge when you're thinking of selling just at the wrong time. I can't tell you how many people I have talked out of selling stocks for what for money they don't need for decades. And then they look back and say, gosh, not only am I glad I didn't sell stocks then, called then you know, spring of 2020 or spring of 2009, pick whatever figure, other time horizon. I wish I had bought more stocks then. So what what you think is the right thing to do in the moment is often the very wrong thing to do. And that's why if, if you don't have the experience, if you don't have the emotional makeup, then work with someone who does. Well, thank you very much indeed for that, Scott and Patrick. I mean, I, I could keep going all afternoon here, but uh, we've all got our day jobs to get on with. Um, 
the guys have written the book where there's a lot more information um, about what we've been talking to today. It's the Compound Code, an expert guide to trading stocks and options. So that's a much deeper dive than we've been able to cover on a short podcast. But uh, thank you very much indeed, Patrick and Scott, for joining us today and for your, for your insights. Thank you, Stuart. It was great. Thank you, Stuart. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to the Armchair Trader podcast. Make sure you visit our website, www.thearmchairtrader.com, for your daily dose of financial markets news and sign up to our free newsletter there.